Hey, what are the big issues that uh, we fight about today? Um, well, you start from the start from the premise that um, what what actually affects most people, uh, and uh, obviously poverty, um, and uh, a lack of healthcare, basic health facilities through Africa, uh, disease, uh, then look to what lifts people out of poverty. And we know what that is. It's what's happened in China. Uh, it's enterprise. So that has always got to be the major issue. What is an immediate threat to the existing lives of people? Um, and that's obviously what's happening in the Middle East with IS. Um, the emergence of China, obviously, at a less threatening level. Um, and um, obviously the continued threats against Israel um, d domestically. Um, we know about the economy. I think domestically I'm always, I'm a pessimist in these things, I'm always so pessimistic about the lies of the left, um, the misleading, the lies of the left in Australia. Um, just, just, at least they think things are better than they were 20 years ago, John. Someone said to me at lunch today, oh, the press are terrible. I said, yeah, but at least now, we had Greg 30 years ago, but now we've got Janet, now we've got Andrew Bolt. Now we've got the Bolt Report. Now we've got the the IPA then and now has always been firing. Um, there's Piers, there's Miranda Devine. The Australian is just crusading with great courage. Um, you know, at least there are voices. Ray Hadley, Alan Jones still going strong. There are voices on the right that didn't exist 20 years ago. So domestically, you feel a little bit more encouraged by the press. Greg? Well, John, I'd say for Australians, there's, I, I'd just give you three categories of issues. The, the first is, can we manage our wealth? Can we manage our budget? Are we able to live within our means? Are we able to generate wealth? The second issue is one that's not discussed enough. Can we defend ourselves? Uh, are we really capable, if push comes to shove, of defending ourselves? And the third issue is, do we believe in anything? Do we believe in anything enough to fight for it, to die for it if necessary? Uh, what is our bottom line? And I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I rather suspect that these matters will be tested uh, in due course. Question. Well, you just wait till the microphone will come. Uh, thank you, Greg, for your very insightful articles. What would you say is the catalyst for Carr changing from being pro-Israel to his um, now stance on Palestine? Look, that's a very fair and perspicacious question, and I'm going to dodge it in the most cowardly fashion <laughs> because um, I have written a few columns about Bob's views on the Middle East and about Kevin Rudd's, and in those columns, I have the chance to give a kind of a complete sort of rendition of, of what the evolution was and where I agree and where I disagree and all that sort of thing. I'm very happy to disagree with my friends, as the Prime Minister will alert you, um, you know, uh, when the Prince Philip knighthood was made and, and at other times. But um, I just am going to be a complete coward. It's pathetic, really, to fall at the first hurdle and, um, but, you know, I would urge you the next time Bob is in front of a public microphone uh, to ask him. I'm going to ask Michael Kroger to speculate. <laughs> well, I speculate that he wanted a position somewhere prominent internationally and the Americans vetoed him. Uh, and that he said, buggy you. And this is what's brought about this change. Um, you know, I'm, I might be completely wrong because you know more about this than me, but I've found very few people over the years, apart from one example I'll come to, who have actually changed their position on the Middle East. I mean, if you, if you grow up understanding the case for Israel, then your views don't change, except for the New South Wales right of the Labor Party, which is one of the great and shattering changes in Labor direction that I've seen in my life. The collapse of the New South Wales right support for Israel is... is incredibly worrying. 
Uh, it's gutted the right of the, of, the Liberal, of the Labor Party in Victoria in terms of how they look at Israel. I mean, at least Shorten and Conroy are sticking firm. But Tony Burke and some of these other treacherous figures in New South Wales, it's an extremely worrying, extremely worrying development. Another question. Down the back, down the back and then down the front. Uh, with the inexorable rise of um, Iran as a nuclear power, can Israel afford uh, not to attack? They seem to have an unhappy uh, choice between a conventional war now or a nuclear conflagration later. What do you see as, the, um, as likely to unfold? Well, look, that's also a very fair question, but I'm less scared of Iran than I am of offending a friend. Um, it shows a perverted co uh, scale of values, doesn't it? So I can answer that. Look, uh, I never thought Israel was going to attack Iran, to be honest with you, because um, Israel, if it's going to attack, doesn't talk. And Israel's been talking about this for four years. Now, I think there was a purpose to Israel's talk. Israel's talk of attack forced the rest of the world to come to grips with this a bit, including the Europeans. The Europeans are sort of, uh, you know, it's their role to be the cowardly custards of the, of the Western alliance, and, and they were forced to be a bit more, uh, you know, to, to bear a closer resemblance to a backbone than is normally the case. And everyone was a bit scared the Israelis might, including the Americans. But my own view was, if, if Israel had had a good shot, it would have taken it, as it did with the Syrians. And Israel was never going to do it because it, it doesn't talk about things that it's going to do. I am uh, aghast at the deal that Obama has done with Iran. Aghast. And I think Obama is proving to be the worst president since World War II. Now, I resisted that judgment for a long time because you've got to go a long way to beat Jimmy Carter, really. <laughs> He sets a very high standard in being a bad president, you know. But I, I think overall, Obama has now surpassed that. The reason, to be brief about all this, but the reason the deal is so bad is that Iran gets everything and gives nothing. It gets $150 billion in sanctions relief. It gets international legitimacy for its nuclear program. It gets to keep every single nuclear facility it had. It gets to keep enriching uranium. The only reason you enrich uranium is to build nuclear weapons. You, everybody else who has a peaceful nuclear energy program buys their enriched uranium from Russia. But if you want to master the enriching process yourself, it's because you want to have the capacity to build nuclear weapons. Now, the only thing I'd say that marginally disagrees with the premise of your question, I think Israel and the rest of us have every right to be profoundly concerned about what a nuclear Iran will, be, will mean. However, I don't think the Iranians, and I don't want Israel to rest on my assurances, but I don't think the Iranians, even when they ultimately acquire nuclear weapons, will use them. The, tragi the tragic truth is that the world has had to manage an increasing number of very, very delinquent nuclear weapons states. North Korea and Pakistan, both in their different ways, make Iran look like a model of coherence you know, the, the, the wackiest people in the world are the North Koreans. Uh, there, no one comes close. And the most dangerous people in the world are the Pakistanis. The way they, they store their nuclear weapons, transport them in open trucks, have Al-Qaeda and the Taliban all through their society and so forth. I'm not being sanguine about the Iranians holding a nuclear weapon. I think it's profoundly dangerous. But I don't think the, the choice is quite as stark as that. But one of the ways we could have mentioned, uh, managed Iran was by a continued robust sanctions regime which would keep the state weak. And you want a weak Iran, not a strong Iran. Obama is guaranteed we're going to get a nuclear Iran and a strong Iran. Question down here and then down here. Thank you. Um, you're talking about the enemy without all the problems we have. But isn't one of the um, great problems now the imploding in the West through expensive energy and taxation so that we're really not in a position to actually fight the enemy if we um, don't have um, substantial wealth creation? Um, well, of course, you've got to have um, sufficient wealth created to make sure that your expenditure on... Um, defence is doesn't uh, 
you know, go below whatever acceptable levels are. I think these days the target was 2%, wasn't it, of GDP? Or was that the, that was the target? Yeah, we've gone down w quite well below that. Um, look, let's be honest, um, uh, Australia has such major borders that we're always going to need help if ever we were attacked by anybody. Australia is not in a position to defend itself on its own. Um, we're about to, well, at some stage, we're about to order 12 new subs uh, to be built over the next 20 years, um, wherever they're built, hopefully in Germany or with the German or French help, but not, not the Japanese. Um, but but um, ultimately, Australia is only going to be defended um, with the help of the United States. Um, ju just, just before you add something to that, um, I just wanted to ask you, you know, are you at least relaxed that the ultimate D-Day in relation to Iran's nuclear facilities have been put off until after Obama was finished <laughs> as president? And do you foresee the possibility of another revolution in Iran in the next five to ten years? Because you have the ageing Ayatollahs, that's all the reasons you know. Is there a possibility that we'll have a spring offensive with a different outcome in Iran? Well, Michael, I'd like to say yes, but I'd, I'd have to say I think the chances are no. The, certainly the D-Day is after Obama leaves office. It, it always was. The Iranians probably could produce a crude nuclear weapon pretty quickly if they wanted to, but they don't want to be in that position. They, they want to have a, a fully accepted, completely integrated nuclear industry which, which commands every point of the nuclear cycle and then they'll start producing weapons in secret, I would guess, and, and then they'll have a nuclear test and it'll be, it'll be game over. Then the question is, do you bomb them even when they already have 12 nuclear weapons and you can't bomb them then, it's too late. I, my guess would be, it's only a guess, but my guess would be that's the way they'll go. That was always going to be after Obama. Obama was scared, I think, that the American political system, which is, you know, the still vibrant elements of it, would push him into a more strong action and he's really a postmodern politician so the only thing that matters is the announcement of the deal the substance doesn't matter at all and i think he hasn't delayed iran going nuclear through this deal i think he's accelerated it because he he lifts the sanctions so they'll be a much richer economy and they'll have much more resources and every part of their nuclear industry is legitimate now whereas before it had to go through quite a quite an energetic international sanctions regime trying to stop Iran from getting bits and pieces you know that you use in centrifuges and so on and the Israelis and the Americans would infect their systems with uh, Stuxnet viruses and so on but uh, on that um, postmodern quality you know um, I, I have a lot of personal regard for Kevin Rudd uh, notwithstanding everything but one of the worst things Kevin Rudd ever did was the 2009 defence white paper in this country. It was a magnificent defence white paper, but it was like Obama's Iran deal. It bore, it bore no relation to reality. We were going to get the 12 most powerful conventional submarines in the world and 100 joint strike fighters and nine battalions in our army and a whole lot of other stuff as well. And it said, these the need for these subs is so urgent, we can't waste a minute, we've got to get moving right away. And it got massive good publicity, this defence white paper, including, I'm ashamed to say, for me, I took it at uh, face value. I said, this is the most, you know, the strongest defence commitment we've ever had. And what happened? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Not one action was taken. From the next day, they started reducing the, the defence budget. And when they were tossed out of office four or five years later, not one thing had happened towards <laughs> producing the submarine. And I think that's a syndrome afflicting all of Western societies. We're getting into a kind of a postmodern politics where the only thing that counts is the announcement. You get good publicity for a day, and the worst thing you can ever do is try to follow through on a program because that's going to be messy. Yeah. Just before the next question, following about postmodern politics, Greg and Michael, uh, is our postmodern politics allow us going to allow us to defend ourselves against Islamofascism? Communism, we fought off, as you said, in a world of strong beliefs. Is the Islamofascism we face today the communism of the 1950s, or is it something different, and are we more or less able to combat it? Well, John, I think it is something different. Uh, um, 
I don't myself use that term Islamofascism, although I don't I don't really object to it. But but I, I think I Islamist terrorism and jihadist terrorism is a huge threat to Australia and a huge threat to all democratic and Western societies. It's the biggest threat in the Middle East. This decade since 9-11 has been very successful for the terrorists. It's been a very, very good decade. They now command tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of active, committed, dedicated loyalists right throughout North Africa and the Middle East and thousands upon thousands of people in Europe and even some people in Australia. Having said that, it's important to remember a few things. Uh, I don't actually believe it's as, as immediate or profound a threat as the Soviet Union was in the Cold War because it doesn't have 10,000 nuclear weapons aimed at us. If the, so if the Cold War kicked off into a hot war, we would certainly have been on the target list straight away. Secondly, I do think it's important to be careful how we talk about this. I, I, I'm the last person to urge us to be merely mouthed, but I am aware that 99.9% .9 of Muslims in Australia have no truck with this stuff. They may have political views that I disagree with and, and they may share a certain area of commonality in the narrative of Islam being persecuted even when it's not really being persecuted. But, you know, I'm, I'm aware... Now, the challenge, therefore, the response should not be to be silent about this challenge. The challenge is to find ways of talking about it which are precise and, and you know, get to the target. There's a big movement of people that want to destroy us and hate our values, and we need to fight back. And the best way to beat IS would be to deal at decisive blows in Syria and Iraq, because the, the, um, the chutzpah, so to speak, of success on the battlefield is their biggest recruitment tool. But I do think, I, I do think we need to just be a little bit careful about the way we, we talk about the issues so that innocent, good Muslim Australians don't feel that they're being um, suffering guilt by association or being picked on because of their religious beliefs. And, you know, there are a billion Muslims in the world. Let's not make all of them into our enemies. Well, it's different, of course, but and in being different, it's more brutal. There are no Soviet gulags. There are no gulags. They just kill people. They don't, ISIS doesn't imprison people, they just slaughter them. It's got social media and it's got lone wolf attacks, which communism didn't have. Its capacity to move beyond borders is immense. It's stateless. It may not have nuclear weapons, but it has social media. It has a capacity to get a message to the world immediately, whereas communism could not. Um, it, it morphs and then it remorphs. So it started with Bin Laden, um, and then we saw what in 2005 um, Al Zakawi was killed in 2006. IS grew out of a splinter group out of Al Qaeda in Iraq. Baghdadi took over, he was killed. Another Baghdadi took over in 2010. There are different strains of it. It's put the Taliban and Al-Qaeda into the shadows because they're soft versions of IS. It has money, it has weaponry, it has a capacity to influence, indoctrinate um, and gain adherence from young people that communism, I think, found harder. It was a much harder sell. These days with social media, you can sell a passionate message. What was their four-part series? Um, the Swords of the... Um, the IS had a, had a four-part series on, uh, on the internet, which was in <laughs> looked, by, looked at by millions and millions of young people, the clanging of the swords. And on and on it goes. So in many ways, yes, it's a very different threat, but, but I find it a, a, an immensely troubling uh, threat. Communism, they had to have arm-to-arm -arm combat, argument-to-argument -argument combat at universities and in the trenches in Eastern Europe. Um, IS, because of social media, can globalise their message in an instant. We've got time for two last questions and then there'll be lots of opportunity to buy books and have them signed. So I'll go one, two. 
And you can ask, those who don't have the opportunity to ask Greg a question can ask him when they're buying his book. Jerome, my question uh, is in uh, general. Why do I feel that the news media sometimes uh, picks and choose on uh, what they want to say about some countries? Um, let me be specific here. I'm talking about India. There's a lots of human rights violations going on in India, and you might probably be familiar with it. Uh, Hindus who don't want to be Hindus anymore want to become Christians. They convert and they actually physically abused, attacked, the churches are burned, and even in 1984, they had the issue with the Sikhs over political religious matters. They were even burned alive. My question is, why are countries like India not on the radar screen when it comes to human rights violations? Why? Well, that's, that's a good question, Gurdip. The, I, I, I'd answer it in two parts, three parts, really. Firstly, don't expect the media to be consistent, for goodness sake. I mean, don't even expect them to be intelligent, really. I, I mean, the media is a very haphazard business. It's, it's very chancy. You know, people have... I get a constant stream of university students wanting to interview me about the selection criteria we have for stories or back at the bulletin they used to write theses about what, what criteria led to a thing being a cover story and... Really, it's so haphazard and contingent and chancy, you know. I mean, if there, was, if there were, for example, a big community within Australia making an issue of human rights in India, that would be reflected in our media if, um, if television cameras were taking photos of it. But I would also come to the defence of India and say that while there are, as you say, serious and grievous human rights abuses in India as there are in, in many, many nations, the human rights situation in India is just infinitely superior to, for example, the human rights situation in China. And, um, uh, but that leads me to the second part of my answer, which is a human rights dialogue in Australia has declined, it has degenerated, it's become a kind of pathetic caricature and inversion of itself. When you talk about human rights in, Ch in, in Australia today, you'll be addressing questions about whether um, paid parental leave should be 29 weeks or 28 weeks or, or whether the leave loading, you know, should be 17.5% or whether you should get triple time and a half on, on uh, grand final public holiday or, or just only triple time. And if you go down from triple time and a half to triple time, you'll be referred to the Human Rights Commission and there'll be terrible... You know, if you're Andrew Bolt, you'll be referred to the Human Rights Commission. We're, that's what we, we discuss now under the rubric of human rights. I can say this for the 1970s, for all the things that were wrong with it. When we talked about human rights, we meant state violations of people's right to life and liberty and religious freedom. And, uh, and that was a much more substantial um, discussion about human rights. Whereas because we've now bureaucratised human rights so much... We, the, almost the term human rights, you hear it and you just turn off. You think, oh, God, uh, this is going to be another question about the gender balance on corporate boards or something. Uh, and, uh, but your, your underlying point, that there's not enough discussion about human rights, is quite right. To go, to be a bit politically bipartisan about this, one of the finest things I attended in Melbourne was a conference entirely organised and uh, uh, brought about by Michael Danby, a Labor Member of Parliament, dealing with human rights in North Korea. And there's not much we can do about human rights in North Korea, but for one day, at least in Melbourne, we talked about it and we cared about it. And there were, there were people in the gulags of North Korea which are savage beyond anything you can imagine. Savage, more savage than I Islamic State. For one day, we talked about them and we cared about them. And that Michael Danby could do that, and he understands what human rights really are. Michael? Final question. Uh, Greg, I have been meaning to join the APA for quite a while, and um, coming to your book launch is what sort of finally got me to come and do it, so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, my, my grandparents were refugees from Asia Minor in the fight between the Turks and the Greeks. Um, they migrated to Greece and my parents came to Australia in the 1950s as refugees after World War II. Now, my parents lived 
a carbon dioxide neutral lifestyle. There was no electricity, there was no running water, and just to get enough to eat, you got up from five o'clock in the morning, you worked till it got dark, you slept for a couple of hours in the middle of the day during summertime because it was too hot to work, and you barely made enough to eat. Now, we came to Australia. That sounds like Greg's upbringing, <laughs> described in the book. <laughs> well, we came to Australia and like all migrants, they wanted us to get an education and they wanted to leave a legacy behind for us. So they worked very hard, they, they were very frugal, uh, getting education was critical. And the education that I've had, the health care that, that my family has had, all the benefits we've had has been because there were coal burning fire stations which generated cheap electricity to, to drive um, the industry that, that provide the surplus. That means we could get an education, we could, we could get wealth. Now, a lot, of, a lot of our relatives came over from Greece and I asked them, how did the Australians treat you when you came over? So we talked about the 1950s, early 1960s, and invariably the, the answer was they treated us really well. We didn't know what we were doing. Because our Greek, that we had a different alphabet, and so they couldn't read the writing like people from an Italian background. We'd hold out money for a loaf of bread and we wouldn't know how much it would be. They never, ever cheated us. Now, what's happened is that the history of Australia has been full of people making sacrifices and being resilient and overcoming incredible obstacles. And yet the left-wing media today would have Australians as the worst people on the planet. And we're totally uh, helpless in face of these overwhelming obstacles. So how, my question is, how do we combat this negativity in the best country on the planet in the best time in its history? What a great question to end. Yeah, look, I, I, I agree absolutely with the thrust of your question, but when you were describing that carbon neutral life with no electricity and no, uh, no lights and no, no hot water and all the rest of it, that life is available to you today if you vote, if you, <laughs> if, if you vote, if you vote for the Greens, that's, uh, that's, that's your future, you know. Uh, uh, Bob Brown and Nick Grimm or whatever his name is from Tasmania and... Um, uh, and um, the Natale and so on. That, that's, you've outlined their election platform. That's it, you know. Um, but I, I want to make one philosophical point in response to your splendid question. There is abroad a hostility to modernity and a hostility to Western society in, in our intellectual circles. So we have enemies without. They used to be the communists. Now there is the, there is the Islamist extremists and some opportunist states... Uh, Russia and Iran and so on. There's an open question about how China will go strategically. It's been sort of okay at the moment, but I think there's a bit of a question mark there. But we have enemies within as well. I have spent a lot of my time um, interviewing Islamist extremists in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia and Malaysia and even in Singapore and in the Philippines. And every single time you go to a, to a jihadist's um, place, uh, a school or, a, or an office or whatever, the bookshelf is full of Western books. John Pilger, Noam Chomsky. Uh, and they are learning to hate the West from the West. And it, our media is sort of a second level carrier of ideas. Uh, you know, the ABC doesn't dream up this hatred of the West itself. It is carrying ideas which, which come from academics and, and the, the writing circles. And, what has happened is in the space of two generations, really, we've gone from a profound love of our traditions, which had its problems. Sometimes we didn't acknowledge the problems in our own traditions. Sometimes we we're overbearing and overconfident and so forth. But we've swung so wildly away from that that we've developed a kind of a, a de facto assumption that everything about the West is guilty and wicked and wrong, everything from the postal system to the food we eat, every single thing to the fact that you can open a refrigerator. Now, obviously, we've got to deal with issues of pollution and we're going to get cleaner and greener energy and all the rest of it. Um, and the societies that do that are typically the wealthier societies. Japan is an infinitely cleaner, greener society than, than most industrialising parts of China. The only real way to get to, you know, a society where you manage environmental problems is to produce a rich society. And the rich society comes from the Western traditions, really. But the hostility now in our, um, in our elites, and I don't want to verbal John here, but this is the sort of thing that, in my view, the IPA fights magnificently by uh, <laughs> celebrating the Magna Carta and 
telling us what's in our history syllabus and so forth. This is one of the reasons I wrote this book. I mean, one, one of my books in the past, one reason I wrote it was because one or two of my sons said to me, they were studying the US alliance at school, and they said, what can we read which is about and supportive of the Australia-US alliance? I couldn't refer them to anything. So I wrote, I wrote a book about it. I was a bit slow. They'd finished that topic well and truly <laughs> uh, by the time the book was published. But really, if you don't like the way culture's going, you've got to not only criticise it, you've got to create a bit of your own culture. And uh, the IPA does this, Michael does this through all the activities he sponsors, and that's what I've uh, tried to do in, in, in the book. There's no big single answer. You can't just elect a government and they'll change it. This is guerrilla warfare we have to wage in our own society. You know, um, public debate in Western democracies, it's, it's adversarial. So it's, it's very hard to actually, so we ever won a debate. Um, we have won some debates. Um, communism failed, but it took decades and thousands of lives to resolve that. Um, uh, Privatisation worked, works. Um, the Howard government's border protection policies, I think they worked, uh, I think, as opposed to the alternative. Um, climate change is real. Um, do you see what I mean? Um, in relation to the first three, it took decades for those debates to be won. In relation to climate change, the left want to assert that debate's over, the science is in. I think the answer to your question is that the left, in my own view, the left are far better campaigners than we are. They're using the media much better than we are. There are a hundred campaigns the left are running. I made a list of them the other week, I'm so depressed I had to stop writing. Um, <laughs> hundred campaigns the left are running. There's not a part of our society, there's nothing, there's no institution in our society that's not under assault from the left somewhere. Whether it's the churches, the banks, uh, the farmers, um, marriage, um, hey? the monarchy, um, free speech, American relations with America, uh, the military, um, um, you know, we're, we're all racist these days, except if you're opposing China, the free trade agreement with China. Then that's obviously, if you attack that, you're obviously not a racist. The left are brilliant campaigners and they're winning so many campaigns, they're using the media much better than we are. And I say to people, I think the power of dem physical demonstrations on the streets these days have become f a more important as a, as a weapon of influence than I've ever seen. And that's because they're visual, they're in social media, and the left are holding a demonstration somewhere almost every day in Australia. Uh, they demonstrate against Pine's book launch the other night. They demonstrate for gay marriage every two weeks. There's a, uh, there, there's a demonstration every few weeks somewhere about global warming. They use these instead of direct mail, instead of newspaper advertisements. You have a demo, you get all of it, they're free. Demonstrations are the left's way of getting millions of dollars of free publicity and they're doing it brilliantly and they are winning, they're influencing the public debate and we have to get a lot smarter, a lot smarter and a lot quicker. Um, I always worry that there's the IPA and there's not many others behind us. When employer organisations call on the federal government to do something about industrial relations, I say, well, what a pathetic group they are. When was the last time an employer organisation, apart from the mining industry, won a debate? These people can never, can't get out of their own way. John, could I just add one postscript? You're I, going I, to I, talk I, about the monarchy. No, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to talk about the monarchy. I just want to add a postscript to Michael's magnificent words. Just one final thought. I've talked far too much already, I know, but I want to add one final thought. There is a reason for hope. Inside every human being, there is a tremendous constituency for the basic decencies. And there is in the broad population, a continuing, ongoing hunger for the basic decencies. So even if we're outnumbered 100 to 1, we're likely to prevail because what we're suggesting resonates with the deepest truths of the human heart, whereas what the left is suggesting is contrary to those truths. So I'd just be optimistic. I mean, I have the Irish view of this. The situation is desperate, but not serious. <laughs> On that very appropriate evening note, let me close uh, the evening. It's been a great occasion. 
Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Greg. As, as I mentioned, please don't leave tonight without a signed copy of the book in your hand. As I mentioned, if you're not yet an IPA member or if you haven't renewed your IPA membership, you can leave here tonight having done that renewal and with a copy of the Magna Carta. And don't forget, next week we're talking about the Magna Carta, we're talking about our history, we're talking about the rise of parliamentary liberalism and parliamentary democracy. So uh, can, I thank you, can I ask you to thank uh, Greg Sheridan and Michael Kroger. And that concludes the evening. Thank you.